One right. of the things I'm interested in seeing, and you're, you're talking about that, Steve, is it's going to come down to the health of Caleb Williams. How much is he going to be able to scramble, extend the plays? You look at uh, Tulane, and uh, they have 11 interceptions on the year. Uh, they have 24 sacks. Now compare that to USC. USC is a little, a little bit more proper opportunistic, number three in the country with 36 sacks. So here's a situation who hasn't had as many carries as Travis Dye. He just started picking up the workload when Travis Dye was injured with Colorado. He did pick up 120 yards against UCLA, 154 against Notre Dame. So it'll be interesting to see what Tulane does defensively to contain Williams and, and um, Austin Jones, and how is that going to affect their secondary? Tell us – who, who, who in the secondary is, is the one that, that – uh, or, or maybe there's more than one that USC has to key in on to uh, see if they can slow down these receivers? Uh, that would be their all-AAC corner, Jarius Monroe, I think, who's going to be have the biggest coverage uh, in terms of the corners, man coverage for this game, who's going to need to stop them. Uh, and then Caleb Williams, I think even if he is reduced to more of a pa- pocket passer in this game, I'm still impressed by his talents. I mean, he he threw for 363 yards against Utah. I know a lot of those possessions didn't result in points in the second half, especially, but he was still getting the team downfield in position to score. And I think even on screen passes to Travis Dye and some of these really good receiving running backs or short yardage receivers USC has, I do think that Williams is going to be able to operate pretty well, even if he's not at a hundred percent health just due to a sheer passing ability, which, I know Tulane faced an injured John Rice Plumley who couldn't get on the run at all in that AAC title game. He had a hamstring injury and he missed mm. half the game, but he checked back in and became more of a pocket passer. And Tulane still almost blew the lead because Plumley was able to dice through that secondary. So that's my comparison I'm making with Caleb Williams is I don't think I'm as concerned about his health, because I think even if he's a pocket passer in this game, like John Rice Plumley had resorted to in the second half of the AAC championship game, I still think that they have a favorable matchup against Tulane secondary. Well, they, they had the 24 sacks. I saw this stat, but they've, um, they've rushed a quarterback or had contact with the quarterback 219 times, which is about seventh in the FBS. So they may not finish the job, but they're getting to the quarterback. And um, if Williams is not a hundred percent, um, or if you have uh, Miller, who's a great quarterback, he can move in the pocket as well, but maybe not as mobile as uh, Williams. That gives you a lot of concern because, you know, they're, they are doing a patchwork on our offensive line, right? We're moving guys around. We're fitting them around because you have Voorhees and, and Nealon out. So you're sliding. Uh, you have to slide over Dietrich to center, and then you got to break in Monheim and uh, Murphy to come in. So it's going to be a patchwork line, right? So my concern is, is like you said, that they have the 24 sacks. Um, but they're getting to the quarterback a lot. So now you're saying they have an all uh, AAC conference corner. That's kind of worrying. So just wanted to put that out there as well. Yeah, the, the sacks and the pressure was why I was saying earlier is why you think that dropping eight and against USC seems like a good idea. But I just feel like Tulane's defense just works best when they're applying that pressure, even if it is a very risky philosophy against a team like USC. Steve, uh, I'm interested in what your uh, uncertainties are about USC. Like you're the Tulane AAC group of five expert, like in terms of studying USC, what questions do you have for uh, Tim, Rick and Tony in terms of uh, anything, uh, you know, you want to find out more of about USC and how the Trojans line up for this game? I mean, I I do follow all 131 teams. So I've watched a lot of USC this year and just one thing, Every game, I was just amazed by the sheer turnover differential and how they were able to rely on that. Even in games where they blew teams out, like look at the Stanford game. I think the final score was 41 to 28 of that game. Stanford turned the ball over in the worst places to turn the ball over near the goal line. Like so many times in that game where it felt like that game should have been closer had Stanford able to get been able to get the job done. So do you think that a lot of that turnover differential this year, because turnovers can mean two things. It can, a lot of it's luck. And then there's a lot of skill involved being in the right positions, having peanut punches and good rip outs on some of those fumbles. Do you think that USC's turnover differential this year 
what would you say is like the skill luck trade off in that? And how sustainable do you think that would be for this game? Well, I mean, the thing is, is I think that if you look at the, the statistics, they vastly show that it's not luck. I mean, you know, there, there's math in that. And, and you don't consider, you don't lead the country when it's luck. Uh, particularly when you actually look at the guys and you see the guys punching at it. Um, one, one, one of the things that sometimes they took flack for is there were times that they were trying to make turnovers happen and then they didn't happen. And then, you know, the media, some of the media got all over the players, but you know, that, that was one of their things. And, you know, quite honestly, one of the things that this defense did very, very effectively was sort of solve some of their weaknesses by creating turnovers. And, and they are not a perfect defense. They, this is, this team is, this USC team is in a rebuild. And I mean, I, I, can't think of a a more successful team in terms of actually the rebuild because I, I Steve I don't know if you watched this team last year they were atrocious and their defense was appalling and so yeah they have holes no they're not perfect but they are doing re- remarkably well and, and they're finding ways to do it and one of the ways they're doing it is with turnovers and and you have a, a kind of a freaky guy right at middle linebacker and Gentry and you saw when he went down. Uh, in that Utah game, you saw the actually interceptions dip a little bit. Um, and when you have a guy in there just doing so much, getting in passing lanes, tipping the ball, making things happen. Uh, again, I, I go with, with uh, what Tony said. There is no, it's not luck. I kept hearing turnover luck. When's going to run out? Well, it really didn't run out all season until Gentry and Danny was hurt. And the fact that two blow twos could be in this game, applying pressure, right? There's two parts to this guys covering the back end and then putting pressure on the quarterback with two below two, the leader in sacks and, and uh, I believe tackles for loss in the FBS teams, uh, he's going to be up in, in, the, in the backfield a lot. So those two factors, along with some really talented guys, you know, Makai Blackman is one of the most, you know, he, we, he came in from Colorado. Uh, he's a great lockdown corner. And uh, I'm, I'm thinking they will say he's healthy. The defensive side of the ball is where I'm worried about tackling. But as far as covering, you know, as far as passing, uh, I'm very happy. Yeah, you need Kalen Bullock, those guys on the back end, especially this game, last line of defense, just to definitely make their tackles. Is what one of the things for USC that I would be concerned about. For Tulane, though, you mentioned Tui Pelotu. I voted that guy as a Bednarik Award winner. I think he's the best defender in the country. And for a team of transfers, he's one of the few incumbent players starting from that atrocious team last year. And he is just an all-around talent. I'm a little concerned about how little time Pratt's going to have just due to Tui Pelotu's pressure because he's sensational and he, he's a future NFL star, I think. So I'm a little concerned about how Tulane's offensive line is going to handle him this game because I feel like there's going to be a lot of times where Michael Pratt just can't let, let these routes develop because there's going to be so much pressure in that backfield. Yeah, and Marlon was the four star, right? His big brother. And we're talking, and then Tuli was his afterthought. This three star kid was coming in after his brother, um, and just turns out he shot. I agree. I think he had the numbers, and he I think he got robbed in, in the award ceremonies. But uh, I think maybe hopefully I'll put a chip on his shoulder, right, and he'll be ready to play. I think that's that's a good point that you bring up, Steve. Is is, is he going to have enough time for these routes to develop? I'm looking at the wide receivers, and you got uh, Shea Wyatt and Deuce Watts. The law firm of Watson Wyatt um, with a 19.8 and 18.5 average. Uh, they run longer routes. Who are some of the possession receivers that that um, catch the underneath stuff in a situation where maybe uh, Pratt's not going to have that much time? Uh, I mean, a lot of the times it is Wyatt and Watson. I said it earlier that Tulane's not really a deep ball team. They're guys that can get a ton of yards after catch, after plays. And they're really just agile guys with a couple good moves in their arsenal that can make guys miss. So Wyatt and Watts can be good short yards threats. But another guy I would point to is Tyrick James, the tight end. He's somebody this year, they use him on shovel passes uh, sometimes. They'll use him on just short yard out routes by the goal line. Like I think Tyrick James is a guy that they really like for short yards threats. Another one I would go to is Lawrence Keyes. He had a huge... Uh, just a quick hitch hook route in the AAC championship game that he took for a touchdown. Lawrence keys is another receiver that I think would be a short yardage guy that could have one of those like six catch 43 yard stat lines in this game that Pratt could go to if he doesn't feel like he's having enough time. So I do think that Tulane, they have, 
it doesn't really feel like that they have really a commanding receiver like some of these AAC teams like Houston and Rice do with Tank Dell and Rasheed Rice. It really feels like more of a receiver guy by committee where Pratt's comfortable throwing to a just a myriad of guys and whoever is open is really his guy. He reads through his progressions pretty well. He doesn't really have a number one target that he prefers.